Welcome to Storytime here on Build a Bear Radio. I'm your host, Victoria, broadcasting from my home library to share these wonderful stories and grand adventures with you this summer. As a teacher of literature, I can tell you every story is better with a furry friend by your side. We have some exciting stories for you this week. This story is a sequel. Following on from the very fun, hello, my name is Octacorn, Kevin Diller is here to read from Octacorn Party. Hey everybody, Kevin Diller here. I'll be reading Octacorn Party, which was created by myself and Justin Lowe with illustrations by T. and Mulholland. And if you're not familiar with Octacorn, he is half octopus, half unicorn. And he was introduced in the first book titled, Hello, My Name is Octacorn, appropriately enough. If you want to f- follow along with this book or check out the first one, you can find both books at your local bookstore or online at IndieBound or pretty much anywhere that kids' books are sold. All right, here we go. Thanks for listening and hope you enjoy it. Hi, everyone. I'm Octacorn, and I'm having a pool party. Octacorns love pool parties because, one, there are pools, two, they are parties, and three, there are usually cupcakes. But there's one problem. What if nobody comes? What if I get so embarrassed no one comes that I have to wear a disguise for the rest of my life? I do not want to wear a disguise for the rest of my life, but I also really want to have a pool party, so... This is a very big pickle for me. Okay, here I go, I guess. I hope this isn't a catastrophe. Catastrophes are even worse than pickles. Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? Will there be rainbows to fly over? Because that's sort of my thing. If there are rainbows to fly over, I'm in. Unicorn is coming to my pool party! Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? I don't know. I'm pretty shy. Can it be a no-talking party? Where we all sit far away from each other, by ourselves? If it's a no-talking party, I will come. Turtle is coming to my pool party. Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? Unicorn won't be there, will he? He thinks he's so great because he can fly over rainbows, but he's a unicorn, so he's supposed to be able to fly over rainbows. Okay, I will come. Seahorse is coming to my pool party. Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? As long as there's breakdancing, because I love breakdancing. I need to leave for the party now, though. It takes me a while to get places. Snail is coming to my pool party. Wait, aren't you leaving for the party? I left a minute ago. I just haven't gotten very far yet. Okay, good luck. Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? Can I eat the other guests? Maybe this isn't such a good idea. Okay, fine. Lion is not coming to my pool party. Hi, I'm Octi. Will you come to my pool party? You probably know what I'm going to ask. Yes, there can be wood to chuck. Fantastic! I will be there. This is the best day of my life. I'm having a fly over rainbows, no talking, unicorns not invited, break dancing, wood chucking. Guests may not eat the other guests' cupcake pool party. Wait, what was I thinking? Unicorn is invited, so seahorse will have a bad time. Snails are terrified of wood chucking. Unicorn will talk turtle right back into the shell, and lion will probably show up and try to eat the other guests. This is a catastrophe. Oh well, I guess I'm not having that party after all. I'm having a do what you want, be who you are, no matter what anyone else thinks party instead. Sorry, Lion, you have to stay outside, but you can have a cupcake. The end. It's complicated being an octicorn and having so many friends you have to keep happy. That was brilliant! I'm feeling inspired to spend my afternoon finishing that story and... What's that? Yes, we do have time for one more story today. Our next tale is a story that is sure to pull you in. 
So Manchiani is here to read from the incredible tale, The School for Good and Evil. Hi, I'm So Manchiani, author of the School for Good and Evil series. There are six books in the series total, with the last book coming out this year called One True King. It's also being made into movies that hopefully will be coming out soon as well. The School for Good and Evil is the tale of two girls who are best friends, a girl named Sophie and a girl named Agatha, who are kidnapped to go to the famous School for Good and Evil. Everyone presumes Sophie is going to be a princess at the School for Good. Everyone presumes Agatha is going to be a witch at the School for Evil. And they are switched into the wrong schools and their fortunes are reversed. And the big question is why? And I wrote these stories because I grew up reading and, and watching a lot of fairy tales, especially Disney ones. And the black and white world of good always winning no matter what always seemed to irk me because it felt like the villains never got a fair share. And even when I read something like Harry Potter, I felt like the Voldemorts of the world and the Slytherins didn't get their say. And so what I wanted to do with the School for Good and Evil was give the opportunity to have villains and heroes get an equal chance at winning in a story. We're going to follow the villains just as, me, as much as we will the heroes. And you get to choose which school you support. You get to choose whether you root for the School for Good or the School for Evil. And you might be surprised at which school you ultimately feel you fall into. And Sophie and Agatha are the two best friends who anchor this story. And Sophie, in this chapter I'm going to read, chapter two, is desperate to get kidnapped to the school for good. She wants to leave her town. She wants to get out as soon as possible. You know, she wants Agatha to come with her too, but Agatha's trying to keep her home because Agatha doesn't want them to be kidnapped to this weird, strange school they know nothing about where they'll never come home again. And it's rumored that kids die there and terrible things happen. So here's chapter two called The Art of Kidnapping. And it begins with Sophie determined to be kidnapped. Chapter 2, The Art of Kidnapping By the time the sun extinguished, the children were long locked away. Through bedroom shutters, they peeked at torch-armed fathers, sisters, grandmothers lined around the dark forest, daring the schoolmaster to cross their ring of fire. But while shivering children tightened their window screws, Sophie prepared to undo hers. She wanted this kidnapping to be as convenient as possible. Barricaded in her room, she laid out hairpins, tweezers, nail files, and went to work. The first kidnappings happened 200 years before. Some years it was two boys taken, some years two girls, sometimes one of each. The ages were just as fickle. One could be 16, the other 14, or both just turned 12. But if at first the choices seemed random, soon the pattern became clear. One was always beautiful and good, the child every parent wanted as their own. The other was homely and odd, an outcast from birth, an opposing pair plucked from youth and spirited away. Naturally, the villagers blamed bears. No one had ever seen a bear in Gavaldon, but this made them more determined to find one. Four years later, when two more children vanished, the villagers admitted they should have been more specific and declared black bears the culprit, bears so black they blended with the night. But when children continued to disappear every four years, the village shifted their attention to burrowing bears, then phantom bears, then bears in disguise until it became clear it wasn't bears at all. But while frantic villagers spawned new theories, the sinkhole theory, the flying cannibal theory, the children of Gavaldon began to notice something suspicious. As they studied the dozens of missing posters tacked up in the square, the faces of these lost boys and girls seemed oddly familiar. That's when they opened up their storybooks and found the kidnapped children. Jack, taken a hundred years before, hadn't aged a bit. Here he was, painted with the same moppy hair, pink dimples, and crooked smile that made him so popular with the girls of Gavaldon. Only now he had a beanstalk in his back garden and a weakness for magic beans. Meanwhile, Angus, the pointy-haired, freckled hooligan who had vanished with Jack the same year, had transformed into a pointy-eared, freckled giant at the top of Jack's beanstalk. The two boys had found their way into a fairy tale. But when the children presented the storybook theory, the, adult, the adults responded as adults most often do. They patted the children's heads and returned to sinkholes and cannibals. But then the children showed them more familiar faces. Taken 50 years before, sweet Anya now sat on moonlit, ro moonlit, moonlit rocks in a painting as a little mermaid, while cruel Estra had become the devious sea witch. Philip, the priest's upright son, had grown into the cunning little tailor, while pompous Gula spooked children as the witch of the wood. 
Scores of children kidnapped in pairs had found new lives in a storybook world. One is good, one is evil. The books came from Mr. Doville's storybook shop, a musty nook between Battersby Bakery and the Pickled Pig Pub. The problem, of course, was where old Mr. Doville got his storybooks. Once a year on a morning he could not predict, he would arrive at his shop to find a box of books waiting inside. Four brand new fairy tales, one copy of each. Mr. Doville would hang a sign on his shop door, closed until further notice. Then he'd huddle in his back room day after day, diligently copying the new tales by hand, until he had enough books for every child in Gabaldon. As for the mysterious originals, they'd appear one morning in his shop window, a sign that Mr. Doville had finished his exhausting task at last. He'd open his doors to a three-mile line that snaked through the square, down hill slopes, around the lake, jammed with children, thirsting for new stories, and parents desperate to see if any of the missing had made it into this year's tales. Needless to say, the Council of Elders had plenty of questions for Mr. Doville. When asked who sent the books, Mr. Doville said he hadn't the faintest idea. When asked how long the books had been appearing, Mr. Doville said he couldn't remember a time when the books did not appear. When asked whether he'd ever questioned this magical appearance of books, Mr. Doville replied, where else would storybooks come from? Then the villagers noticed something else strange about Mr. Doville's storybooks. All the villages in them looked just like Gabaldon, the same lakeshore cottages and colorful eaves, the same purple and green tulips along thin dirt roads, the same crimson carriages, wood front shops, yellow schoolhouse, and leaning clock tower only drawn as fantasy in a land far, far away. These storybook villages existed for only one purpose, to begin a fairy tale and to end it. Everything between the beginning and the end happened in the dark, endless woods that surrounded the town. That's when they noticed that Gabaldon, too, was surrounded by dark, endless woods. Back when children first started to disappear, villagers stormed the forest to find them, only to be repelled by storms, floods, cyclones, and falling trees. When they finally braved their way through, they found a town hiding beyond the trees and vengefully besieged it, only to discover it was their own. Indeed, no matter where the villagers entered the woods, they came out right where they started. The woods, it seemed, had no intention of returning their children, and one day they found out why. Mr. Doval had finished unpacking that year's storybooks when he noticed a large smudge hiding in the box's fold. He touched his finger to it and discovered the smudge was wet with ink. Looking closer, he saw it was a seal with an elaborate crest of a black and white swan. On the crest were three letters. S. G. E. There was no need for him to guess what these letters meant. It said so in the banner beneath the crest, small black words that told the, children where its, uh, told the village where its children had gone. The school for good and evil. The kidnappings continued, but now the thief had a name. They called him the schoolmaster. A few minutes after ten, Sophie pried the last lock off the window and cracked open the shutters. She could see to the forest edge where her father, Stefan, stood with the rest of the perimeter guard. But instead of looking anxious like the others, he was smiling, hand on the widow Anora's shoulder. Sophie grimaced. What, his, what her father saw in that woman, she had no idea. Once upon a time, Sophie's mother had been as flawless as a storybook queen. Anora, meanwhile, had a small head, a round body, and looked like a turkey. Her father whispered mischievously into the widow's ear, and Sophie's cheeks burned. If it were Anora's two little sons who might be taken, her father would be serious as death. True, Stefan had locked her in at sundown and given her a kiss and dutifully acted the loving father. But Sophie knew the truth. She'd seen it in his face every day of her life. Her father didn't love her, because she wasn't a boy, because she didn't remind him of himself. Now he wanted to marry that beast, Honora. Five years after her mother's death, it, would be, it wouldn't be seen as improper or callous. A simple exchange of vows, and he'd have two sons, a new family, and a fresh start. But he needed his daughter's blessing first for the elders to allow it. The few times he tried, Sophie changed the subject, or loudly chopped cucumbers, or smiled the way she did at Village Boys. Her father hadn't mentioned Honora again. Let the coward marry her when I'm gone she thought, glaring at him through the shutters. Only when she was gone to her new world would he appreciate her. Only when she was gone would he know no one would, could replace her. And only when she was gone would he see he had spawned much more than a son. He had born a princess. On her windowsill, Sophie laid out gingerbread hearts for the schoolmaster with delicate care. For the first time in her life, she'd made them with sugar and butter. These were special, after all. A message to say she'd come willingly. Sinking into her pillow, she closed her eyes on widows, fathers, and wretched Gavaldon, and with a smile, 
counted the seconds to midnight. That's just a little bit of chapter two from The School for Good and Evil, the first book in a six book series available at retailers nationwide and around the world. Thank you. Thank you for that, Soman. It's so exciting that the final book is coming out and we're going to find out what happens to Sophie and Agatha in the end. I can't wait to finish that book and check off another great adventure from my Build-A-Bear summer reading list. If you haven't already, make sure you head over to buildabear.com forward slash radio to download your own free reading list and track your progress. Thank you so much for joining me here on Build-A-Bear Radio for another great episode of Storytime. With new authors joining us each week with great stories, you won't want to miss out. Bring your coziest blanket and a cuddly furry friend every weekday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, exclusively here on Build-A-Bear Radio. Until next time, I'm your host, Victoria, closing this chapter of Storytime. See you soon.